Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Stephanie Erickson. She has a book called Plan for Aging Well, which is definitely something we should all be doing. So thanks for joining me, Stephanie. My pleasure. Thank you so much. So we were chatting before about your book, and there was three chapters that really interested me. One is a topic I talk about a lot putting together a team, but we also touched a little bit on how we age correctly, how we age maybe not as correctly, and then planning not just for your financial and physical health, but also the health of your soul. So can we start with um, maybe planning for, or excuse me, talking about how people age well and how they age not so well? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, first of all, there's a range of what's well and what's not well. So the first thing is we have to define what that means to ourselves, right? Because a lot of people, and I think women in particular, I know me and my friends, we talk a lot about aging and we're talking about our skin. We're talking about our wrinkles. We're talking about what our, our body changes. And that is a piece of aging, but there's the other part, which you alluded to and we'll get to, which is the heart and the soul of aging. But in terms like in in relationship to the book, when I'm talking about aging well, I'm talking about meeting all of those needs that we have, those holistic needs, the body, mind, and soul, and doing that in a way where we are transparent and inclusive with our family, sharing what our expectations are, our value systems, having conversations prior to a crisis, because most of us end up reacting once there is one and we forget to plan in advance. So really, I think aging well is about having some forethought, thinking in advance about what you want your life to be as you get older, and then sharing that plan and getting the buy-in from those around you. That makes sense. And as most listeners know, I have a grandmother that's 102 and a half. So you definitely want to plan because I don't think most of us at the beginning of our adult life expect to live to be over a hundred. And she did say three years ago, three and a half years ago, she was striving to hit 105. And this was right. I know right after my dad, her oldest son had passed away. It happened to be her 99th birthday day. We interned him at the military cemetery and I was like 50 and a quarter. And I just remember thinking, I can't, I can't, there's, I'm just exhausted. There's no way. I don't quite feel the same right now. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I'm all about quality. I mean, if I can live to be 102 and do all the things that I enjoy or not, maybe not all, but most of the things I enjoy. Great. If not, mm, not interested. So is there a way of kind of planning so people understand what our option, what our opinion of quality is? Because Make sure I say that right. Quality, not quantity. Well, you were saying what you were saying is that you you want to live longer as long as you can live in a way that's comfortable for you. And so I think that's about rethinking what our own expectations are in terms of what we're going to be able to do physically, because the reality is, is as we get older, we will have more physical difficulty moving around. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm very fit right now and very strong at 50 but I'm definitely not the same as I was when I was 25. I was more fit and even stronger, right? And so when I'm 90, I might still be really strong, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to, you know, pump out 30 push-ups or something, right? <laughs> so I think we need to be realistic about what we mean. And I think part of the challenge that I see is that people connect aging with that physical body and we're not addressing the other parts of us because I think even if our body slows down, there are things that we can do internally that can bring us a lot of fulfillment and satisfaction. So even if our body is not is not moving in the same way, we can still feel fulfilled. And that to me is the real challenge about aging well is, is getting in touch with that part. Definitely having a purpose and And if you have a purpose, then you can feel fulfilled is important. So can we touch on that a little bit before we move on to the other topics we were going to talk about? Yeah, I think a purpose is is good. And, you know, our, our, our identification so much is about the roles that we play and so much around work, right? So when people, when you meet someone, um, you'll say, so what do you do? It's not like, who are you? What are you about? 
It's what do you do? So everything is about, you know, our role as a social worker. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, you know, it, it's all of these roles. And so I think finding a purpose beyond what those roles are is really important. And to start to find that deeper part of who we are earlier on, because eventually we won't be working. Eventually our kids won't need us in the same way. You know, so if I'm not a social worker, who am I? If I'm not caring for kids who are saying mommy, mommy, mommy every 15 minutes, then who am I? I need to find something else within me that makes me me that I can carry on beyond. And I think for me, that's about the purpose is knowing who you are in another way outside of those traditional roles. I guess I was lucky because I never, I have one daughter and I never lived my life through her. I had my own life. We had our family life. And obviously she was a huge part of that and very, very important. But my husband was one that went through the empty nest syndrome when she moved out. (laughs) And he's, he's making comments from the other room. And, And I, cause I, she was 25 when she moved out. So she didn't move out you know, as traditional, she didn't move, she commuted to college. So we didn't, you know, we didn't even get that dorm experience. And I was ready. And I thought about what's our life going to look like when she's not living with us, when it's just the two of us and the dogs. And I think that helps a lot because it, it helps the transition. That's for sure. And yeah. Yeah. And I think having something like you, before we started, you were mentioning cycling, you know, you have something, a passion that you're doing that has absolutely nothing to do with, you might do it with your husband. You, you, you might, but that doesn't mean that it's associated only with him. It's an activity that you could also do with other people or on your own. Um, And I think that's really important is finding that identification. Now I have a lot of those things that I'm doing for myself and my life doesn't revolve around my kids in that way. However, I will be like your husband, because this is me, you know, last weekend, I went to buy my son winter boots, and we moved from the kids section to the adult section, because now his foot is big enough to be in the adult section. And I broke down sobbing in the store, because now my baby's in there. So I came home, like, I'm, I'm in trouble. Like when this kid, <laughs> this kid's been out of the house, I'm, I'm, but I do have other things, but I still think I'm a bit overly attached to my kids. <laughs> maybe it's just well and she's always been very independent so and we're really close but it's not like you know she just lives down the street and some you know i haven't chatted with her this week yet and by chat that means text messages of course (laughs) of course (laughs) but that's okay because you know she knows i'm here i know she's there and you know she'll send me cute little Um, photos of her bunny or cute funny things she finds on the internet so it's like I know I'm in her life and I'm in her mind and that's good yeah now I don't have to be hovering all the time and driving her right up the wall yeah (laughs) so what ways do people age right and what ways are we doing it wrong because I want to make sure I'm on the right side here (laughs) yeah well as I was saying to you in terms of doing it right to me it's it's understanding who you are at the deeper level and expressing that to your family and your loved ones, getting their buy-in to make sure that that plan is in place so that all of those needs can be met as you age. To me, that's, that's aging well. In terms of the you know, concept of my book, that's why when I was looking down in terms of that concept, obviously there's other things to age. Well, you know, you eat, you eat right and not too much alcohol and you ex- and you exercise, blah, blah, blah. But I, I'm talking about like in the context of my book, the things that I think we're doing wrong is avoidance, which we all do when things are uncomfortable, we don't want to do them. And it's a human reaction to just put things off and procrastinate. And that's getting us in a big old mess, a big old mess as families and as a healthcare system, because we're just like, well, later, later, we'll deal with it later. Let's deal with, you know, what's happening right now. Part of that is I think ageism, but part of it is I just think this like death aging phobic society that doesn't want to deal. So to me, that's what we're doing wrong. And it's just creating more heartache mm-hmm. and problems for us down the road. I've actually seen quite a bit of that this year with caregivers whose loved ones have passed away. Like my mom passed away in March, the very oh, end of sorry. March, the very, thank you. The very beginning of the pandemic, which was really a blessing and it was a blessing for her. And I was still shocked at how much and how, how much it affected me when it happened and how much there are days when I'll see a picture of her 
in the memory care and smiling and laughing and and then realizing that she didn't really have that in the last almost year. And it's just like, you know, so then it kind of kind of just right hits you right in the feels, as people say. But there's so many people that and with dementia or Alzheimer's, it's so hard to see when they're really getting close to the end. Cause, and I always said, I'm ready for this journey to be over. My mom had Alzheimer's for like 20 years and I was, I was ready. I thought, <laughs> but she fell and broke her leg. And that was the last straw for her body. It just, it was like the, the last injury. It could, you know, we hear about people falling and breaking a hip and dying two weeks later. It's kind of what she did. And I joke sometimes when it's, when it feels okay to make the joke is that her care pr costs were going way up and with, and then we we're right at the beginning of the pandemic and we still don't have the option that she and I used to go to the park and the pool and the library and watch kids. Cause that's what she liked to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not been a really good option this year. <laughs> so, you know, I think she just kind of, you know, if she had a moment of clarity, I think she would have been like, this is nuts. All of this is crap. I'm out because mm -hmm. that would have been my mom, but it's been, go ahead. I was going to say, you're touching on a lot of things. And if, if we're going to move on to that next part about the heart and soul, you're touching on a lot of things that I am and discussing in my book, you, you said that, you know, you were taking your mom to the park and to the library and to the pool and she enjoyed watching children. That is an, an exemplary example of what we need to do to feed our soul as we age. And for her, that brought her joy. It accessed a part of her that who knows what memories it was sparking or the feelings that were coming up for her. Maybe at some point along her journey, she wasn't able to communicate as well in terms of this is why this is benefiting me. But you could recognize it in her behavior and in her mood and her expressions. You could see that it was, it was beneficial. That's what I'm talking about, about accessing that other part of us. And no matter where we are in our aging journey, whether it's dementia or not, that we provide these kinds of experiences for people and not stick them in the corner mm -hmm. in a wheelchair in front of a blaring TV. Because I'm sorry, that doesn't feed your soul unless no. maybe you are a news announcer. And so you like watching <laughs> the news. I mean, it, like it's a very small percentage of the population that that probably is feeding their soul, you know. So I love hearing that. And that, that's exactly what I advocate for in my book. Well, I'll have to. Uh, I'm sure my daughter and my husband and almost son-in-law know I'm like very creative. And this year, 2020, we moved to align our finances with the... Um, recession that the economists were threatening for 2021. So I apologize that we <laughs> we planned ahead and I don't know, we brought up on the, the end of the world, it feels like. Mm -hmm. And when we, we just, we're, you know, we're, where we're staying is temporary. We have plans for next year, finding a new property, new kind of not a new lifestyle, but a little bit new. And so I just said, let's just set up this house for everyday comforts and everyday living. And, you know, we got rid of lots of the entertaining stuff. I mean, I had like way more wine glasses than any restaurant needed, much less a household. And I got rid of a ton of crafting supplies because a lot of them were really old and it was, and I just hung on to them because I had the space. I'm like, you know what? I gave them to teachers, I'm like, you know, right before, <laughs> right before they stopped having kids in classrooms and after we moved, it was like, well, now that I can't go to the store and just pick up whatever it is that, you know, sparks my creative urges, I started making greeting cards for the residents where my mom lives. So I've got a huge batch of Halloween that is getting delivered. We're, we're recording this right before Halloween. And I'm going to do the same with Christmas. And it takes hours <laughs> and I lose myself and it's lovely. So Whatever creative outlets I can do when I'm 102, like my grandmother, that's probably something important to continue doing as I age. Because I get really cranky if I can't be creative. So. Well, and then that's something that's important for you to communicate with your family and for them to probably already see and observe. And that's the thing is that, you know, if we pay attention to people, actually pay attention. I know it's a lot to ask. Actually <laughs> listen again. I know it's a lot to ask, but we're given so many clues about 
what is important to somebody and what feeds their soul. So when I, I do this presentation about the aging heart and soul, which is the, uh, the title of one of my chapters, and I do a presentation on it. And what I'm saying is, look at yourself and look at somebody else. When do you see them smile gently? They're not talking to you, they're in their own bubble, but you see a little smile you hear a little hum to their voice. Is it when someone's digging their hands in the garden? Like when is that moment where you could tell somebody sort of disappears and lets go? That is their soul speaking volume. So pay attention to yourself like you are so you can communicate that to your family so that if you are ever ill, they can provide that for you. And for your aging family members, caregiver, pay attention to them and say, okay, what feeds their soul? And how do I reproduce that for them? And to meet, you know, whatever their capabilities are at the time. I, I tried that with my mom. My mom was very creative. She did painting, woodworking, sewing. And about six months or so after she was in the memory care residence, I realized that one, if she was aware, and I didn't think she would be, but she would not have Christmas gifts for the three grandkids. And so I came up with a very, very basic craft project that she could do as a gift for the three grandkids. That did not go well. <laughs> and I think the problem was at that point, her visual processing was so bad that, and she was very stressed about getting it wrong. And I, and I found that very, very frustrating. And that was actually the beginning of the podcast because I was searching for ways to connect with her because she could just sit around and shoot the breeze. Well, that's great if you don't mind answering the same question every three minutes, which after 20 minutes I did. And so I was reading books and I was researching on the internet and I realized, man, caregivers don't have have their family member at home. I don't have time for this craziness. Let me see if there's a podcast. And at the time there was one and it, it just, it wasn't my flavor. So I crazily started my own. <laughs> there's your creative juices picking up again, right? Yeah. And it's been nice because 2020 with the pandemic and social distancing and all that, my other career of being a portrait photographer, I knew when we moved, you know, it's, it's been a battle to, maintain that business since the last economic crisis we had 10 years ago. And I, I finally said, you know what, I'm 99% retired from that because it's just too much, too much yeah. to try to deal with. And, you know, so I, I don't have that creative outlet. So, but I have others and podcasting is surprisingly, it's a different creative flavor and I really yeah. love it. So, yeah. <laughs> so how we, how should people, we've talked about how we age well and thinking about our purpose and what lights up our soul. And we have to communicate that with our families. So what's okay. We've, we've kind of gone through that personal process of thinking about like, now I know, I mean, both of my, my husband, and my daughter, they know, cause my daughter's also a little creative. So <laughs> I would, I'd be surprised if she was unaware that that would be important to me as I age. Where do we go now that we've done the soul searching and the self-discovery of so we can age well and start planning? Now, now what do we do? Communicate it. <laughs> I mean, she says that like it's so easy. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it that it's easy, but it's the next step. We can have a million fantastic ideas in our mind. And if we don't put it out in the world, it's doing nothing except, you know, wrapping around, uh, you know, our brain, and, and it's not going anywhere. So obviously, the next step is communicating. And that's where you have to involve other people And the concept of team caregiving, which is the third point that you and I were going to talk about today. It's your team is you. And it's your loved ones who are like your closest circle. So a spouse or your adult children, or your parents, but then it broadens out, you know, you have other family members and other friends that might be implicated in that plan. But then there's every single healthcare professional. And I'm not talking about just the doctor and the nurse, I'm talking about the social worker and the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist and then um, the spiritual advisor or a chaplain, if you're lucky enough to be in an environment where you have that kind of a person, uh, the dietitian, 
You know, there, there are so many different kind of people that should be involved in that team. And so how we need to communicate what kind of care and support we want to all of those people. So everybody is on board, making sure that our plan is fulfilled. So I'll give you an example at this um, one of the residences here where I live at one point, this is years ago, the care has gone downhill since, but years ago, they had a physician on board who was very much about balancing your body, mind, and soul. And one of the patients there was uh, a diabetic, he had diabetes, so, but he always wanted ice cream. And so what the physician would say to the nursing staff is, you know what, this guy is 95, give him a little cup of ice cream. Let's just adjust his medication. Let's give him that. It makes him feel good about his life. So this is what I'm talking about in, in communicating your wishes is saying to the doctor, my dad loves ice cream. I know he's got diabetes, but we got to find a way to make it work. And then creating a plan with the doctor who then informs the nurses when they're giving the medication and the nurse's aide who goes to, you know, everybody's on board and helps fulfill that for the person. That's about creating a team. How do we go about creating that kind of team? Because I tried real hard for my mom. And when you bring up doctors, I still want to strangle her doctor because <laughs> I'm not sure he had any of those things in mind. I'm not even sure because he, the do her original general physician left the practice. And this was a younger guy who was really nice, but... <laughs> I swear he was completely clueless about Alzheimer's because he'd ask my mom questions and I'd have to mutter under my breath what the truth was. And I always had to retrain them every time we'd go in and they'd say, well, you know, here's a, a sample cup for a urine sample. And it's like, really? You know how we did this last month, right? Mm -hmm. It was so frustrating. Her neurologist was great. She spent a lot of time with both of us. She would talk to my mom and but she was listening to me. So she kind of split her focus, which I was very impressed with. So my mom never realized that she wasn't a hundred percent of the focus mm -hmm. or if, if she was aware of it at the closer to the end of her life. And the problem with the neurologist was she was always behind. So you would go, you know, show up for your appointment. And I would, yeah. and I would tell them I'm here. We're going to go across the parking lot to, get something to drink because she gets really agitated. Wait, I mean, you know, when you're advanced yeah. Alzheimer's yeah. five minutes can feel like five hours and she would, yeah. we were there once waiting for an hour and Oh my goodness, she got hostile and it was not fun. So <laughs> we yeah. fixed that, but you know, just the care staff in her home was great and they did what the doctors told them, but I never felt like I had what you're talking about. So how can we, like, how can I, make that happen for like my husband and I, how can we start setting yeah. up that kind of team before we really need it? I wish I had the, <laughs> you know, magic spell for this because it's an ongoing frustration for me as well as a healthcare professional being in a system where it's like talking to, you know, a blank wall. And when it comes to working with some professionals, um, there are some physicians who are out of this world in terms of their compassion and the time that they afford for families and the way that they'll listen to other professionals and their opinions and respecting my opinion as equally to their own. I've had amazing experiences. And then I've had the absolute opposite where it's because the MD is behind the name somehow my opinion is not, you know, valuable, let alone a, a caregiver, right? So, and that's not just physicians, it's all professions. I don't have the magic answer for that. I think it needs to be a shift in our society, in the way that we look at aging and the way that we value human beings as they get older and the way that we see that we're all in network, that it's mm -hmm. not just my mom is getting old, it's my mom is getting old and I'm trying to care for her and it's impacting my health as well as my husband's health and our relationship and my child needs me because she just had a baby and I can't be as available. And I think we need to kind of shift the way that we look as aging as an entire society. And then hopefully some of that will trickle down into the way that we support people. The only advice I could give to you or to any caregiver right now is be the squeaky wheel and demand it. Just keep asking for it and advocating for that change. And if you, you know, have, um, you know, representatives, a political representatives in your area who believe in mind, body, soul, 
and, and aren't ageist and value older adults, team up with them, align with them and try and see what kind of effective change you can make, at least in your own, in your own small area. There is no magic solution though, unfortunately. My husband and I have this conversation about the shift our society needs to take. He's a realtor and he used to be on our city's planning commission. And there are things like where we lived was a mile up a very steep hill from the main road, which was great. You know, we didn't have a lot of road traffic noise, but down the block, you know, down the, our street was our friends who had, her husband's got Parkinson's disease and, you know, it wasn't a walkable neighborhood. You couldn't walk to the grocery store and you, know, you really couldn't ride your bike to the, gro you could ride your bike to the grocery store, but God forbid you wanted to bring home like a gallon of milk or something because it yeah. was deep hill coming home. And we kind of separate people almost by decades because, you know, you're up here in the executive homes where obviously you've had to work longer in your life to get to that level of financial security to afford those places. And we were in a neighborhood in Denver where the, edge of the neighborhood was like condos and then they had like townhomes and small homes and the further you got into the neighborhood away from the main road the bigger the houses were and so it was an entire like one neighborhood was like spanned the generations and i've always said like the care homes need to be near schools like my mom's was across the street from a middle school and those kids would come over and do a lot of things with the assisted living Wonderful. residents yeah, it was one. And, and they would bring, sometimes they'd bring over the memory care residents earlier on when my mom was a little bit more with it, which is not really the right term, but more able to participate a little mm -hmm. bit. They would bring some of those, those residents over as well. And it was, you know, it was good for everybody. And, you know, I just keep and saying, you know, starting there, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but okay. I don't want, I don't want to lose this train of thought because starting there with young kids is super important because, as a society, like I said, we have this ageist view where we think that people lose value as they get older. It's a huge frustration for me because people don't lose value. In fact, if you want to ask me, they gain value because they have so much wisdom and experience that we're missing out on a whole area of wisdom <laughs> that we could be getting. But including children like that, like your idea of having you know, a care home across the street from a school, it's amazing because it's also teaching the children at a very young age the value of older adults and not to be afraid of them. And they're not scary and to make those connections. So when they, those kids get older, they will have already like, you know, integrated that into their view of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to approach this. It's such a like a, a larger way than we are as a society. And not only do neighborhoods pocket, but we do that with older adults when they no longer can care for themselves and they need help. We just send them away because we don't have the resources to be able to do it at home. And I'm not judging anybody for having their parent live in an assisted residence. I couldn't, I have to pay my bills. We have, we're a double income earning family. We have no choice. Life is fast. The economic demands are big. Like that's the way we've, we've fallen as a society. And so now this is the only way we can deal with it is to send people away. And this is just contributing to us thinking, well, we don't have any more value in those people. So let's just, uh, you know, send them away. It's, it's awful. I have a friend who's 85. He's in our Rotary Club. He's a really fun guy. And they moved from a large single story home with a very, very large yard that was much too much for them to maintain to a retirement neighborhood, you know, the 55 plus neighborhood. And he hates it because there's no kids. Mm -hmm. And when we moved out of our house, one of the, you know, there's four, well, there's four in that particular, there's like four or five of those neighborhoods around. There's one that's the active adult community. And then there's the one that's got more of the older 55 plus community. And we talked about, well, do we want to go over here or over there? And I mentioned to my husband that this particular friend of ours does not like living in the adult, the senior neighborhood because there are no kids. And you know, there's days because we've got toddlers behind us. So there are days when it's like, yeah, I think I'd like to live there, but yeah. I think I don't think it's as healthy. The active adult community, I think, 
would be better, but I'm not sure these adult neighborhoods, these retirement neighborhoods are really that great an idea unless they're so insulated that they've got like the library and the grocery store and everything they need is kind of right there, which is not the case. But then they're missing out on the the rest of life and, and all the other benefits of all these other people, you know? And I think, (laughs) <laughs> this is interesting. I haven't had this discussion with anyone, but it's an interesting concept is planning cities with an intergenerational lens. And how can we do that? Um, that's, that's a really interesting topic. I want to talk to this colleague of mine about it because he keeps saying like, we have no innovation in, in older adult planning. It's like status quo. We're like robots. You know, every, every other field gets innovative and they see it as a positive thing. We start trying to flip senior care upside down and people are like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You know, but that, that's an, a very interesting concept um, that you just brought up. Anyways, I think, I think it I've- comes up because I live in a bedroom community about 50 miles northeast of San Francisco. So people commute out or they did until this year. And being in the San Francisco Bay Area of California, what part of the reason we moved was, okay, we're going to wait, you know, because the real estate market is going up, 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 up. We also know what's going to happen. So we're like, okay, we're going to catch it on the downside swing because the house we sold, we bought top of the market and we sold at the top of the market. So it's like, let's, let's write this ship financially. That was the plan. And people are moving into our city because it's, they don't have to worry about the hideous commute of, you know, an hour and a half to two hours, which I think is just, you know, it's ridiculous that we ship all the jobs to one area and then people drive and it's bad for the economy. It's bad for our health. And, you know, we, so we have this conversation a lot. Well, he'll make, cause our city does not have a lot of good jobs as, you know, retail service, you know, all the jobs that have gotten smashed by the pandemic and, but we have a lot of, you know, like white collar management type people that can work from home. So our city's doing okay. But we've talked about things like, you know, where, where we live now, there's a lot of these houses that have the in-law unit. And I said, well, this is great, except that, you know, we need all the services. Like if I was to have my mom live with me, I still need the services so that we could continue working like you were saying, you know, like we need door to door transportation, not just, you know, pick grandma up on the curb. Yeah. Like my grandmother isn't walking out to the curb because one, she can't see it. And now she's very frail and needs a walker. And my mom would have wandered down the street. You know, I would have had to stand there and wait for the bus with her. And it's like, that's not always a possibility. So I think once you've been in the caregiving space as a family caregiver, you can see where there's just like this huge need. And, you know, I'm not expecting the government to like fund all of this, but somebody's got to get the ball rolling. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and if we talk about intergenerational approaches and we talk about living with purpose, which is something that we started the conversation with, you know, after retirement, why wouldn't that be a a normal transition is, okay, I'm now retired. So now I'm going to be part of this transportation, this volunteer transportation system we have within our community for door-to-door support for those that have a disability or, or aging or whatever it might be. And um, a child, a, a teenager can get a job in not driving that bus, but being a part of it to help people move and ambulate around. And why don't we hire a teen to do that job? And now the teens being sensitized to this population. And I mean, there, it, you, I think there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, but the priorities, and again, this goes back to, I think we're an age of society, the priorities for funding and innovation, as uh, Francis says, and just even time, resources, it's there, they don't want to, people don't want to spend it, not people, the governmental bodies that fund these sort of programs fund other things, and they're not thinking about aging. Which is amazing, considering the average age of our federal government is not terribly young. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, we have older adults like running for office right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the two oldest, I mean, Trump is currently the oldest president ever. There will be I, the two. Old, well, whoever wins is going to be the oldest ever. Exactly. And so, yeah. so it's insane. And yeah, you know, it c- makes me kind of laugh because it's like, oh, the one thing I kept advocating for was we needed to stop having old white men run the country. 
Well, now they're older. <laughs> they're older white men. <laughs> apparently, I need to ask for even older white men. Maybe we'll yeah. get some like somebody like Kamala because you know Kamala well, Harris is from here. Yeah, we got a young woman there on the ticket, and a woman, woman of color, young. So, and from a progressive state, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's and I I have to admit when. I heard Joe Biden talk about his caregiving plan and it wasn't just child care, but it also included family caregivers. I literally cried because I was like, please, God, this is what we need. Cause you know, I'm a Gen Xer. You must be too. And it's like, we got to figure this out like a long time ago. Cause like the baby boomers just keep getting older and older and older. And then yeah. we have the millennials coming up. I think the beginnings of them are going to be 40. My daughter's a, millenn a younger millennial. She's almost 29. So, you know, I still sometimes hear millennial and think teenagers. So <laughs> it's like, I don't think of the Gen Z's as, as teenagers when they are, but it's like, we better figure this out rapidly because, you know, our cities are not set up for, aging well and and caring for people well and it's just oh yeah yeah it's a mess so yeah <laughs> we're yeah. gonna have to take it upon ourselves to advocate for all of that to advocate for ourselves plan for ourselves which you know i think is kind of the american way of doing things so what else should we be doing before i let you go this afternoon what is like um, one thing you wish people were doing and taking to heart um, buying my book. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> that, is um, down, that is linked in the show notes. So you guys can click on it, <laughs> buy it. I make it really easy to order the books. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just making a joke. Um, I, know, I love jokes. We need more jokes. <laughs> I, I just, the time, the time is now we shouldn't delay, you know, get out of your comfort zone and start to have some really awkward conversations first with yourself and what your biggest fears are and what you're worried about as you get older, start there, have some clarity on that. And then, you know, start with someone that you trust, start opening the door to have those conversations. Okay. So we're making it easy for everybody to get the book. Where else should we start once we've done our soul searching? Yeah. So excuse the new frame. We <laughs> lost Wi-Fi. Now I'm on my phone. Anyways, let me go back to, I've said something amazing, but let me try and repeat it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's um, not always the way. Yeah. I, th I, what I was just saying to you is you were asking me kind of like my final thoughts. And for me, it's really just about doing something now, starting the conversation now there. It's very uncomfortable and I get it. I don't like to talk about, you know, difficult topics either, but not talking about it, first of all, doesn't make it happen faster and it doesn't make it go away. In fact, what it does eventually is minimize the anxiety and the concerns we have because things are out in the open. So I think the first step is to really have those difficult conversations with yourself, who you are, what you really want, what are your biggest fears about aging, what are your expectations, what do you hope to achieve as you get older, how would you like to see your life at the end, your last four, five, six years, how do you envision yourself and your family? So starting with the internal conversation and then start branching out and sharing that with just one person, little by little, slowly, slowly. It's not, um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? So just kind of starting that conversation first with ourselves and then with others to kind of get the, get the plan in place so the plan is not imposed on you. Because trust me, not planning just means when a crisis comes and then we're panicking and then we never get what we want. So Thinking about things in advance will really help. I totally agree. My paternal grandfather, he will have been gone 23 years, December 2020. He, I must have gotten it from him. He was a planner. He had the um, burial sites picked out and funeral. I mean, he had everything <laughs> planned out. And he would sit down and try to talk to my Nana, the one that's 102, about it. And she she was not down for that conversation. And I'm curious now, I don't know if I'm, I might, I might see if I can broach the subject. I'm wondering if she regrets that he mm -hmm. was doing a crossword puzzle and she asked him if he was ready to go to dialysis. My dad's side of the family is they have all had, all the men have had diabetes. So he said, yeah, I'm ready to go. He put his pen down and 
died immediately. It must, it must have been a massive heart attack. And, you know, thankfully he had everything planned, but she wasn't aware of all the plans. He may have told the youngest son because the youngest son is a pretty good planner. But being the youngest, he also doesn't assert his knowledge. So I'm curious if 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 she what if she regrets not having had that conversation. But mm. you know, it is hard. But like you said, if we don't tell people, hey, you know, well, if we don't tell like my mom always said, Well, I don't want to be a burden on you girls and I want to live in my home forever, which ended up being mutually exclusive. You know, we you can't have those conversations. Like I couldn't say. I don't know that you'll always be able to live in your home. What kind of options do you think we should have? And I wouldn't have gotten the surprise as my dad was on hospice to learn that he just assumed she was going to come live with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, <laughs> I did not have a spare room at the time. So, you know, it's, yeah. I, I do advocate for having these conversations early because, you know, be assuming things is never good and yeah. trying to make decisions in a crisis is just horrible. So, yeah. I really yeah. appreciate this and sorry to hear that you guys are having a storm coming. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's what, right. St what state are you in? I'm in Montreal, actually. I'm from uh -huh. California. I'm from Los Angeles, but I live in Montreal now. Well, I'm sure you're glad you're not in the LA area right now. Well, yes and no. I miss my family desperately. Oh, well, they're having a huge fire down there <laughs> in Irvine. Yeah. So awesome. Well, I appreciate this. And like I said, the book is linked in the show notes. I Highly recommend you. you guys click on it, order it. I link it to um, an independent bookseller, but you can always get it through Amazon if you want. And it's pretty blue with nice yellow letters on it. You guys can look at it in the YouTube video. So thanks very much, Stephanie, for grabbing a second device and finishing the conversation with us. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Technology. My pleasure. <laughs> thanks so much. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.